I was working at this place that uh, made experimental commercials, and uh, there was a black guy there who said, I just saw what your paycheck is. You're making more than I am, and we're doing the same job. So I went in to see the boss, and I said to him, um, this was not far from here, too. I said, listen, whatever the guy's name was, he, we're doing the same job, and he's making less than me. And he said, if I give him a raise, I'm going to have to give you a raise. And we're right back where we started, and that's in the film. And that's how it started. Uh, and then gradually, because the, uh, we were making experimental commercials for, uh, I got into what advertising might be like and what if, what if, and then the film evolved from that. Well, it wasn't an agency, it was a film house that serviced agencies. And the guy who ran it was a very, very radical guy who loved movies, who wanted to try other things. So we had this little division that, that he kept downstairs because everybody hated us. We used to make films on weekends and, and experimental commercials. And we even, um, what was it? Preparation H was one of the problems they gave us to go make a commercial in a hurry. And we had this, um, right around the same time, this Asian girl beckons the camera to come to her face and we zoom up and she's holding the preparation H, the tube. And she says, no, how'd it go? No matter what your ethnic affliction, use preparation H and you can kiss your hemorrhoids goodbye. And then we, we sent it into the client and they said, this is great, but we could never use this. But it, it helped them rethink some of the things they were doing and they did send it to festivals. So that's the kinds of, kind of nonsense we were doing. We did one for Albaline. Is that a face cream? We had um, Donna Mills, this actress from television. She was 16. And we had her sit up in a coffin at 120 with makeup. And every time she touched her face, she got 20 years younger. And then the copy underneath said, Albaline, the look younger cream. And then there was a shot of my kid nude on a rug. He was like less than a year or so. Good for diaper rash, too. And we just had fun. Then we go, that was Saturdays. Then we go make our stuff Sundays. So it was a great time in, in New York to be trying new things and trying to be a filmmaker. And it was, it was fun. You didn't have to have names in your movies. I knew a fellow named Swope. And, and one of the guys in Putney Swope, the white token guy they keep around, went to Putney School, which is in Vermont. It's a private school. And he's a funny guy. He told me, <laughs> which made me want to use the name. He told me that when he was in school, he had a relationship with a cow on the campus. And I said, come on. He said, yeah, don't tell everybody. I said, now I'm telling you. Uh, I thought that was pretty wild. And anyway, I put the two names together, and that was the name of the character. Well, it happened because the guy who played the part wasn't great at remembering his lines. So the cameraman said to me, I was really upset because we're really low budget, and we're really nervous, and we're starting to slip behind because... And he says... Don't worry, look at him, he has a beard. You can put anything in there, even your own lines. <laughs> so that's what we did. He was a nice guy, the guy who played the part, but in fact, he just passed on. I spoke to somebody in, in Los Angeles who called. He passed on a, uh, about a year ago. Um, I think he was upset, but he, he was happy with the movie, and, and then I, I think he started trying to talk like me a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I had to do it. It was chaotic back then because, first of all, nobody wanted the film. We, I guess the, the producer of the film screened it for every distributor, and they all laughed and said, there's no way we could blah, 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 blah. But one distributor in New York who owned <clears throat> a lot of theaters in New York and also distributed films... Cinema 5, he saw the thing, and uh, it was great. He said, I'm going to open it in two weeks. And I had given up. I thought, like, 
a couple of my other films have been down in the village and had nice reception, but this was uptown, you know. And he opened it in the Cinema 2 up here, and it caught on. But I think the film was a little bit too crude for executives to really want to hook up with somebody who made that film. Um, but I did get to make Pound through a studio who had originally turned down Putney Swope to distribute. Um, and uh, the, the interesting part about that film is I, I was lecturing at Temple University with this film mm, about three years after it came out. And uh, after the lecture, a kid came up in a bow tie and a jacket, and he said, Mr. Downey, which terrified me anyway, I was, you know, 30-something years old, he said, I want to thank you for getting me into advertising because of this film. Like, he took it, and he said, it looks like so much fun to me. It looks so great. That's what got me into advertising. And I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, it's pathetic. I thought I was making the point, if there was a point, the other way. So I do remember that, and just a lot of people seemed to enjoy the film, as I remember it, and some hated it. That's all. Even the cat remembers. That's how old it is. Uh, so, oh, that's cool. That's great. Oh, you little weasel. So what, so what happened was that's really been the only film of mine that ever got well distributed. The only one, because the guy owned the theaters, he loved it, and he jumped on it, and then he sent it around the country. I remember I was on a, that, that was the year of Easy Rider, and I was on a talk show with Jack Nicholson, who I knew to be a writer, more than an actor. And uh, there was a black actor on the show who was complaining that Putney Swope didn't give enough jobs to black actors who were in the union. We were a non-union film. And that he didn't like the film anyway and blah, blah. Nicholson, th thank God for him, said, what makes you think you're above satire? What makes you, th you know, whatever, whatever. And it was a kind of an interesting thing. So uh, I'll never forget that moment. As I left the show, Nicholson was in the hall, and I said, you know, your screenplay, I think the film was called um, Ride the Whirlwind or The Shooting, or it was a Monty Hellman film. I said, your screenplay was terrific, and he went, I'm an actor now. <laughs> He's just a good guy, and he's one of the producers of the thing I'm working on that I hope to do, he and Jonathan Demme, um, and, a, and a wonderful guy named Peter Seraf. The three of them are really trying to get my new little film on, and they're great, and they're fun, and they love my stuff, and I mean, I, you know, I'm very pleased by that. He's, uh, he's like a... He's like a 30-year-old guy who knows about the 60s more than I know. Paul. I mean, he knows more about me than I know about myself. And in fact, his, his uh, girlfriend told me that. When I met him, I couldn't believe he knew this, he knew that. He wanted to know about this person in New York and this person. He, he wasn't even born. But he was possessed with that. And, and he's a wonderful writer. He's made another film. And if you've seen Hard Eight, I like that one the best. So the, the guy in there is going to be in my thing and also Seymour Hoffman and his crew. So it's incestuous. You know, Paul's girlfriend is a beautiful singer, and um, I can't imagine that he hasn't told her about the 60s, so I don't have to do it, and he wasn't even there, so he is outrageous. You know, and he loves films more than, more than most people I've run into. Back then, credits were so ridiculous. I mean, everybody put... The, and that started the thing about a film by and a such-and-such such film. And I just thought it would be funny. I was on the Carson show during Putney time uh, a couple of times, and either he or Carl Reiner, I was on twice, said, well, why are you a prince? And I'll rem I remember what I said. I said, remember, I'm 30. 
um, too young to be a king and too committed to be a queen. Big laugh. <laughs> so I, then I dropped that after. I didn't use the Prince thing, but it's back now uh, with these guys. They won't. St <laughs> uh, my newest script is not a satire. I mean, there are some satiric things in it. It's a, it's a love story. So I think the world has turned into where the, the president of the United States now is a satire. In fact, this morning he was on CNN making fun of his faux pas and getting big laughs. I mean, the, I got to say one thing about him. He's, he's not embarrassed by any of this. And he went back over everything that was ridiculous and, and got laughs on it. And that's why Saturday Night Live, I guess, in a way, is, is not satiric. It's just whatever's in the news, they're going to give you as soon as they can. And there's no new slant. You just, I tune in to see who the band is and see maybe who the host is or whatever. I don't, I really don't know. I mean, in England, I imagine satire's a little bit more uh, edgy because there's still some pomp and those class things and whatever. Here we're beyond satire. It's almost irresponsible to do it. I, I'm trying to think, what, was it relevant then even? Was it ahead of its time? Was it, you know, I don't know. I just know that there was a three weeks in 1968 when Putney, Easy Rider, and another film, which I can't remember, I think it was last summer, with Barbara Hershey, who was then Barbara Seagull, or she changed her name to Barbara. Those three films came around the same two weeks, and it felt like American alternative stuff. It wasn't even called independent. It was underground, at least my stuff. Uh, Easy Rider was backed by a studio because um, one of the producer's father worked at that studio and, you know, and they were terrified of that when that came in, that movie. It seemed there was something going on that hooked into whatever was socially going on and what the movies were. So it was a nice mirror of Putney Swope and Easy Rider going on. It was like, wasn't really about the movies as much as it was about the society. So that's why I'm happy to be working on um, stuff that's more emotional. It's good for the writing anyway, different for me. And my last film, I was starting to get that way, and it wasn't all like that. But again, I needed names to get it on, it was Sean Penn and my son and Malcolm McDowell. And that's three years ago. I still had to have some names or it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, go do it. And if you have an idea and you have a collaborator, get out there and do it. If you have to do it on weekends or whatever and round people up, yeah, do it. And I think there'll be more outlets. I hate the word venues. Uh, places where they'll show. A lot of these theaters are going to go digital. And maybe what Redford was trying to do with having Sundance theaters in each one of these cineplexes will be one reserved for stuff for people like the question you're asking. That would be great. It's, you know, and I also think that with all these television channels, I see more shorts on television now. That's a hopeful thing. And the only, uh, the only thing I can say is maybe because everything seems so obvious and conservative and you know in the in the structure of the country and that maybe now is a time of renaissance and we just don't know it because we're going through it where you do a lot of stuff yourself and you don't count on somebody saying no I don't want to do this this scares me this I don't know this and that and that and this or you'll be 10 years fooling around in that system There was talk of somebody doing a remake of it, which I couldn't understand. And then I, Arthur, the, f the producer, said, well, maybe we can figure this out. How, how could you do an extension of this film? And, uh, 
And my wife, who's a writer, said the only way to do it is to show, and I think she's right, is to show, and your son could play you, what it was like to make a film with all these black people back then when you're white. Because when Putney didn't know his lines, some of the other actors came around to me and said, get rid of this guy, I'll play the part. Get him out of here. And my thing was, hey, guys, I didn't want to tell him I was going to dub him, these other guys. And I said, no, no, we're too, and it was true, we're too far along. I'm not replacing anybody. The guy's a good actor. He's fine. He's perfect for the part, blah, blah, blah. And um, so what do I think of it? I think to do it now, the politics of it are, are not here in, in that form. So I don't know, why would you do it over? And, it's so, and there have been scripts. I never wrote them. I would love to have been paid to write one of them. Uh, and it's never been done. Somebody was going to make a musical out of it in Seattle. <laughs> I heard that one. 